Last of today, so I'm presenting affirmative action and demand for schooling. Evidence from a nationwide policy. This is joint work with Anna Paula Mello from Howard University. It's very early stages, so comments are very welcome. So affirmative action in higher education has been adopted worldwide to mitigate inequality in access, in performance, in graduation. The economic literature has shown that these policies are indeed very effective to decrease inequality in college access, especially to elite universities and to high return majors. But a much smaller strand of the literature analyzes how these policies adopted uh, at, at higher education institutions impact students earlier on in their educational trajectories. For example, how those university policies affect students, uh, high school students' effort and human capital accumulation. A couple of theoretical papers show that the impact of affirmative action on pre-college human capital depend on how they change admission probabilities. So we know that if you create an affirmative action for a targeted group, it will increase admission probabilities for these targeted groups, and you'll decrease admission probabilities for non-targeted groups, but the impact on high school students' behavior will depend to the extent of how affirmative action will change these admission probabilities, and how students will then perceive the changes in their returns to pre-college human capital. On the empirical side, the, uh, the literature has found mixed evidence on the impact of uh, affirmative action on pre-college human capital decisions. Some has found positive effects, some has found negative effects, and it shows us that the design of the policy matters, the aggressiveness of the policy matters, the context matters, and the way we contribute to this literature is then by asking, well, does affirmative action in higher education affect high school persistence and demand for college? And we do so by analyzing a very large affirmative action reform that took place in Brazil in 2012. I think this is maybe the most aggressive quota reform in the world. I'm going to explain uh, later. And this is targeted at students that graduated, that studied three years of their high school in a public school as a proxy for, social, for low socioeconomic status. And we look at how this policy affects high school dropout, high school graduation, and college demand. So we use um, the take up of a national college entrance exam that we take in Brazil as this proxy for college demand. And to identify the causal effects, we explore both geographical and time variation in treatment intensity. So we explore the proportion, like the, the expansion of the proportion of college seats that are allocated to, to affirmative action quotas by municipality. I will get into detail soon. And we also exploit, uh, we look at how these effects are heterogeneous by type of school and by school socioeconomic status. So our context uh, is Brazil. So affirmative action policy in Brazil started in the early 2000s. They, those were policies that were adopted by public institutions, both federal and state colleges. Those colleges, they comprise around 28% of total enrollment, but importantly, they are considered of being the better universities in Brazil. The, they are on average of superior quality than the private universities. Plus, they are free tuition, so there is high competition for these, uh, for these spots of those highly selective institutions. And these affirmative action policies, they most often, they primarily, the group that these policies chose to target are those students that graduate from public high schools. It's really weird when I talk about this in Europe, they don't understand this, but I think for um, an audience of mostly uh, Latin American and, and developing countries, we understand this better. So the government chose to target public schools because it was the easiest proxy for low socioeconomic status that they could find. And there are also always sub-quotas destined to, to non-white individuals, black, mixed, and indigenous, because those groups are historically underrepresented in public colleges, especially in selective majors. So until 2012, these policies, they were a choice of institutions. So institutions decided to adopt by yeah, the way they adopted different types of policies, different intensities. 
or there were some state laws that mandated state universities to adopt these policies, but there was not, no national unified uh, policy in place. Until 2012, when the federal government approved what is called the quota law, Lady Cotas, and it established that 50% of all of all spots of in each major and in all federal higher education institutions in Brazil have to be reserved to students that studied the three years of high school in a public school. And then there are also sub quotas for non-white and for low-income students. But here I'm going to focus on the quotas for this national, the broader uh, group that is the public school students. So the, the policy was approved in August of 2012 and it started, universities had to start to adopt this national policy in their admission process of 2013. They had around four years to to reach full adoption, to reach 50%, but they had yearly minimum quota requirements. So there is a large expansion. So this is the variation at the extensive margin that we're going to explore in this paper. So if you see, there were 94 federal higher education institutions in Brazil in 2012. So in 2012, a little over 50% of these 94 institutions already had some sort of quotas for public school students. Uh, but then in 2013, 100%, all, all institutions adopted these quotas because of the federal law. And if you see, this line is for the state universities. They are not subject to this national federal law, so they, there's not much of a change here. And this is the total variation. So here is the share of college seats that are allocated to quotas for public school students in the federal system. So in 2012, there were already 23% of seats that were already allocated to these quotas for public school students. And this expands, reaching in 2015, 48%, but like full adoption, uh, Yes, yeah, uh, it was in 2016 when they reached 50%. But then uh, our data spans this time period, so basically we explore this uh, this shift here, which was mostly primarily due to the 2012 federal law. Okay. All right. Uh, so we know we gathered the data, so we know how each university in Brazil was exposed to this national law. But here we want to understand how this policy adopted at the university affect high school students, high school, high school students' persistence, how uh, high school students take up of this college exam. So we don't know how each high school student is matched to each university because you can apply to any university in the country. So we have to create a measure of exposure. So what we do here is first we create this measure of affirmative action exposure for municipality M and year T, which is the percentage of total seats in municipality M and year T that are allocated to affirmative action or to quotas for public school students. This measure is normalized to vary from zero to one. So one is 50% of reserved quotas or full adoption of the national policy. And we also know from, uh, we gather also, uh, we have administrative data of pre-reform flows of students between high school and college. So we observe these theta. So for example, theta MM is the percentage of students that lived in municipality M during high school, and then keep the students that stay in, muni in municipality M during college in a pre-reform year. So this is the percentage of stayers. While theta MD is the percentage of students from municipality M that were attending high school in municipality M, and that moved to college for, uh, to municipality D for college, also in a pre-reform year. And we use this pre-reform flows to weight this uh, affirmative action measure of local exposure. So we create for each, for, each, for, for 
students that were attending high school in municipality M, the treatment exposure of these students is defined by this expression where the, the treatment for municipality M at time t is weighted by the percentage of high school students that stay in that municipality for college and then the treatment at any municipality D in the country is weighted by the percentage of students from municipality M that moved to municipality D. So in basically we just use this pre-reform flows to weight treatment happening at any municipality. We could do this by distance or anything like that. We try different things. But basically results are robust even to using only treatment happening at the municipality where the student resided for high school because 87% of students in Brazil attend university in the same municipality where they reside. So basically we do this, but this is robust to also not doing this. And in principle we can, when we use this definition, we can define treatment for students uh, of any municipality in the country. But in practice, when you look at the data, there are many municipalities that do not send any students to higher education, to federal higher education. So if there are zero students from high school at a certain municipality that go to federal higher education, then these theaters are going to be zero. And then we don't, have a, then we don't define exposure for this municipality, and then we cannot, those municipalities are, are not in our sample. So then our final sample is restricted to municipalities for which in the pre-reform year, students actually go to further higher education, okay? So then we estimate this equation where outcomes, so the outcomes that I'm gonna show you today are high school dropout and take up of this college entrance exam. So then why is the outcome for a school S at municipality M and time T? So our Time period spans from 2010 to 2015, some pre-reform years and some post-reform years. So this AAMT is this, is this measure of exposure that I just defined. DZ is a vector of municipality time varying control. So basically we, we have to control for the adoption or the expansion of the centralized admission system. CISU, the Brazilians will know that also is being uh, expanded during these years. We try also some other time varying controls like GDP and things like that, but uh, our, our results are robust to not controlling for this as well. But the control for CISU is important. I can explain later. Uh, we have controls for school fixed effects and for time fixed effects, and our standard errors are clustered at the municipality level. And we weight this equation by school size, so our outcomes are at the school level, and yeah. <laughs> All right, oops. Okay, so really briefly on the identification strategy. Uh, our identification here relies both on the geographical and time variation in treatment intensity. So in the proportion of college seats that are located to affirmative action, the, the way that institutions expand uh, this policy in these years depend largely on already on the share of affirmative action that they had before the national policy. Uh, so basically, we are relying here on a parallel trends assumption that the dynamics in the outcomes between treated and controls would be parallel in absence of the treatment. So in a previous paper of mine, uh, that was my previous job market paper, what I showed, I, I also, in this paper, I look at the effect of this quote expansion on the demographic composition of universities. And what I show in this paper is that the pattern of adoption of affirmative action by the federal institutions during this period is not correlated with pre-trends in the enrollments of low socioeconomic status students at these public universities. This means that these federal universities, the way for in which they adopt, they expand these quotas in this period is not correlated um, to changes in their student body. So this is because Universities are expanding the quotas because of the national law that is adopted in 2012 that externally mandates that they do so. So our identification strategy here uh, relies on the fact that if universities are not adopting 
quotas due to what they observe in their students' body, it's very unlikely that they are adopting, they are expanding these quotas because of what they observe in the behavior of high school students in their municipality, all right? So, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, we show it more formally through a placebo experiment in the paper, but I didn't include here. All right, so I have only five minutes. So let me show you some results. So this first, we have some results for high school dropout. So this is the targeted students, so students from public schools. And these are non-targeted students, students from private high schools. So a full adoption of affirmative action of the quota law decreases high school dropouts for public high school students in 1.9 percentage points from a baseline of 18%. And it doesn't change dropout rates for students from private schools, which is important because in theory, we could also expect that the non-targeted group, that this group would have uh, lower incentives to study, lower incentives because now they have lower chances to get to university. So in theory, we could expect this to go both ways and it's important that we find zero effects in this group. So there is uh, a positive effect on the targeted group, but no negative effect in the non-targeted group. So there is a decrease in the baseline social and economic gap in dropout rates by 11.45%. Then we look at this demand for public colleges this, uh, that we measure through the take up of the national exam. So what we see is that for public school students, the targeted group, there is an increase in 4.2 percentage points in the take up for this national exam. But for non-targeted group, for the private school students, there is a decrease in the take up for this exam in 6.9 percentage points. I'm gonna show you our, tell you about our hypothesis about that soon. And then, I think my last slides of results. So this is just some of the heterogeneity, the most interesting one that I think. So what I show here is that for the results on the college exam take up, this increase for demand for college for the targeted group comes from students from low socioeconomic status schools. So these students, before they didn't even take the exam to go to college, and now, I mean, there is a large increase in this group. So now there is, we interpret this as an increase in aspiration. So now these students aspire to go to college and before they didn't even take this exam. While this decrease for the non-targeted students is concentrated among private school students from high SES private schools. And yeah. So what we show in this paper is that affirmative action in higher education can affect pre-college human capital investment decisions. So affirmative action in Brazil contributed to the narrowing of the socioeconomic gap in high school persistence and in demand for college for public college. So regarding these negative effects on demand for public college among the high SES private school students, we are still investigating this more, but we, we, are, we, we have in mind two positive effects. One is that these students are delaying college entrance. Now it's getting more competitive for them. So this uh, is this demand for college right after conclusion of high school. It might be that they are going to preparatory courses. They are very common in Brazil, and they are taking this exam. Anna, my co-author, thinks that this is likely, but I, for me, what's going on is this thing. Those students are being displaced to the private universities, so now they don't even want to take this exam to attend federal universities anymore. I mean, now they, they, those very rich uh, private school students, they are just moving to the private universities right away. And for those universities, you don't really need to take this national exam. But we, are still we still have to connect data with the, um, uh, the higher education data to really prove that this is what is going on. And what is also important is that we find economically significant effects that are induced by marginal short-term changes in policy intensity. So we, what we explore here are really year by year changes in this in the intensity of affirmative action during this period and we already find effects and also we are working now 
uh, on a dynamic specification in which we explore the timing of exposure of different cohorts to this law, and then we expect to find even larger results. But what is important is that, well, affirmative ac action is a very controversial policy in Brazil till today, but then any policy debate that ignore these facts, that ignore this positive effect on human capital uh, accumulation, may understand the benefits of these policies, also understand the costs, and so it's really important to have a full picture of how these policies affect different outcomes to really understand like their importance, and, and that's it. Thank you.